on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. If you've got a character in your book or wherever saying uh, too much information or did I say that out loud, you have unwittingly stolen a line from friends. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers. No more barriers. No one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome to The Self-Publishing Show with me, James Blatch. And me, Mark Dawson. Uh, here we are, Mark, in the middle of summer in the Northern Hemisphere. A shivering down under. My daughter's shivering down under. We shouldn't forget that. So there are people in, in the cold. That's true, and it's raining here. It's uh, just look out the window, and it is raining over the river. So uh, my wife is quite pleased because she can't ride her horse at them because the ground's too hard. Ah, uh, so she's been hoping. She's been hoping for rain, and there's actually quite a lot at the moment. So yeah, the going is firm. It, very very firm, too firm. Yeah, and he's just had an operation, which means he can't he, he can't really do t- too much on hard ground at the moment. So. Uh, no, should we, should um, we please with this. We love talking about the weather in Britain. Uh, it has. Uh, it's going to get warmer though. I've got the British Grand Prix, I've got Wimbledon on Friday, and the British Grand Prix at the weekend. I'm very excited about both events, and uh, the weather is looking okay. Yeah. Now you have to watch on YouTube for this bit, but um, you and I got some gifts during the week, a few days ago. Oh, we end did of last week. We did, yes. And I got the most unique gift anyone's ever bought me before, and I I find it very very. Brilliant. Uh, it is, or it was, a sealed, you know where this is going, spare part for Vulcan Bomber. If you're watching on YouTube, that's a Vulcan Bomber behind me, big Delta Wing four engine nuclear capable, or capable of dropping nuclear weapons, REF bomber from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s even. And the spare parts, you know, when you, you build a bomb, you have all these spare parts, a lot of them get used. Some apparently don't, didn't get, so this was off the shelf. And I, on a live, not a live TikTok, but I recorded it as live on TikTok, and I actually unsealed it with a knife, with my trusty um, bottle opener knife. Really, really annoyingly, I think this is one of the only TikToks I've recorded that can't be redone. And my microphone started playing up in the middle of it. There you go, I have to live with that. Uh, so so I, I went through well, it. You always seal it with sellotape. And we do it again. Never that, would be, that would be lying. But uh, so no one's seen this since 1965 until about 10 minutes ago when I recorded the TikTok. You can go and check that out. But um, it's got this beautiful old wax paper. But what's exciting about this? Basically, it's a switch for an aeroplane. This is it. So probably I'm going to guess. So when you say when you say it's exciting, exciting. <laughs> what you actually what you actually mean is I, it's I not exciting this... in the, at all, apart from you. I think this would have been mounted in the ceiling above the pilots. But listen to this. You want, you want to hear something very satisfying. That is a perfect click. That's a precision engineered aero click. Have you just, have you just dropped a bomb on Moscow? There are, God, I hope not. Um, well, maybe. Uh, there are a few more satisfying things to do. And the exciting thing about this, if you get into a Vulcan today, there are a few scattered around the country, a few of them just cockpit, some of them the full thing, but you can get in there and look around. And I took my dad, who was a Vulcan pilot in there, and he got a little bit sad because it, it was a reflection of him getting old. And this thing, they, these things are knackered now. They're, they're a bit broken inside. The windscreen's all opaque and cracked. Everything looks old, um, which is understandable because they were built in the late 50s and they've been sitting out on the grass. But this is brand new and it looks all shiny. And it's a bit of a Vulcan that has not been weathered. And um, I'm going to put it back in its case, but hang on, just one more time. Can you just put the IC- isolate the uh, ICU too, will you, Winko? Done, Captain. Oh, God. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> the fun I have. Sorry, everybody. It, what a fantastic gift from Stuart Grant, who works on this podcast. It is a great gift. And um, yeah, he, Is- um, and it was very. He sent me a gift as well, which is he sent me something from Back to the Future, which is he knows is one of my favourite films. So that was very thoughtful. And one of the he great sent films. me a absolutely and a, a vinyl edition of a Depeche Mode album I don't have. So that, again, very very thoughtful of him. So we're we're very he's a very nice very nice man and 
recommended. If you're looking for websites, we should probably yeah, give him a shout. He's uh, he was well, a sponsor. Yeah. Actually, he was he was a little he was a little bit ill before. Yes. Before the uh, yeah, shut up, James. He was a little bit ill before the show and um, came to the show on on Tuesday and Wednesday and was very busy and um, I know is 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 busy with with making lots of authors very nice websites and we don't recommend many people um in spf but he would certainly be one person we would recommend if you're looking for a website and i think it's digital author toolkit is that right yeah digital authors toolkit i think uh plural um yeah yes that's not why he gave us presents so we give him another plug he gave us presents just to say thank no you. i know no no uh, he's just because he's a nice guy um, but we are going to give him a plug because digital authors toolkit is a fantastic place to go for an author website and i know he's pretty busy i know that um the show is does very well yeah. for him uh, but he's a good business person, so he always has been, and a valued member of our team. So I've got my little toggle switch. I don't know I, what I can attach it to. So I need a Vulcan. Bo- Eventually, I'm going to put all the panels around this desk here, so I'm sitting in the cockpit of a Vulcan bomber. God. <laughs> midlife crisis, anybody? It's, as the midlife crisis yes. goes, it's not a bad one. I, mean, I could be having an affair buying a sports car. My wife bought a sports car. I suppose I should have had an affair, but I'm Fred instead. I'm going to um, get a Vulcan bomber cockpit. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, okay, look, we're still sort of buzzing and recoiling from our uh, our conference in London. It was uh, it was a tremendous couple of days. The more I reflect on it, it's hard to reflect on it at the time because we're mired in the organisation and um, supporting Catherine, who does most of the work on that front. Um, but nonetheless, you sort of barely look up. But the more I think about it, I think it was a good conference and simple people seem to really enjoy it. And we're now eagerly anticipating getting the video production back. Um, that will be released on August the 3rd and 4th. So all the work's going into that now. And in addition to that, we are putting together a bunch of value-added sessions, including from the aforementioned Stuart Grant, who's going to do a session on uh, a one-hour author website. So really valuable sessions all of that will go live on the 4th and 5th. We're going to have some live Q&As to go along with the launch of that. Um, and you are not too late to sign up for that. You can go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash digital uh, to get your uh, get your digital ticket and all that stuff will be delivered to you on those dates. Um, and yeah, so that's coming up. We uh, hopefully will have a slightly quieter period in July, quite like a little bit of time off. I don't know about you, Mark. Um, I think you're going away at some point, aren't you? I mean, if burglars are listening, don't give the precise yes. dates. But you're going away. No, we're going. We're going to Southwold for a couple of weeks. Um, it's because the kids finish school this week. Um, so Friday is their last day at school. So we'll be going off at some point in the next few weeks for a little break. When I when I won't be doing too much work. Or they're doing oh, some well, work, but not too much. Um, maybe uh, Mrs. Blatch and I'll bring the dogs walking on the beach with you. Although our dog will probably kill yeah, your absolutely. dog and vice versa. Do you take your dog? <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Scout's comes, a lovely yeah, dog. Yeah, and, and Dora's yeah. a lovely dog. But I suspect the two of them would be, people would be laying bets on who's <laughs> going to win. Scout is quite easy. He only goes, he's not friendly with other boy dogs. So I think he probably would be okay with Dora, whether Dora tries to, you know. Dora, Dora doesn't care what sex they are. Yeah. Uh, she's, um, she okay, generally, she's does, she generally goes for... Yeah, she's a psychopath against certain dogs. Other dogs she loves and plays with, so we don't really know until that moment. But um, right, she's okay. unpredictable. Anyway, well, possibly. We might just come and have a drink instead. Um, okay, and yeah, so a slightly quieter period. We are going to release ads for authors. We do have a date in the calendar for that. So ads for authors is going to be released in early September. The precise date, I think, is the 13th. Yeah, the anniversary of me passing my driving test in 1984. Uh, so 13th of September. Oh, there you go. I'm such a 1970s radio no. disc jockey, aren't I? You are very, very much so. You are well. You're, you're Partridge. That's the kind of thing Partridge would say. That's exactly what and, Partridge um, would say. And everyone, everyone loves you for it. So, yeah, very mm, nice. Must be. Anyway, we've waffled much too much. We should. Um, yes, we've got th- we've got three of these to do today, or the next couple. Of so we should we should get a move on. We should get a move on. We have a really. I mean, obviously, we're very entertaining and funny. But our interviewee today is a professional funny person, uh, Dave Cohen. He is a comedian and a comic writer. He writes for some quite well-known sitcoms here in the UK. So, if you're in the UK, you might know "Not Going Out" is the one I can remember. I think he's worked on lots of shows that you would have seen on TV in the past. Have I got news for you? And so on. And he's written a book on writing comedy. It's not just for people who want to write comedic books like rom-coms on how to be funny and what makes funny and all the technical side of it. 
uh, but also comedy for those of us who write in other genres but have some light uh, moments. So often we have a, you know, what Mark and I used to call in our BBFC days, comic relief character, someone who's got a bit of comedy to them. Um, you probably don't feel the need to have comic relief in your rather dark, noirish John Milton novels, but uh, I think a lot of people do, and I, I certainly do like to have a little bit of levity. In my books. Cause Mark, I'm a funny guy, and it's, be hard, it's hard to repress that. Well, you, are, you certainly are funny. Oh, that's, that's such true. a long no, gap. No arguments such for me. a long gap. It doesn't matter now. I've had to think that long about it. Uh, <laughs> anyway, okay, here is Dave <laughs> Cohen. Uh, he's going to talk to you about comedy, and then Mark and I'll be back for a chuckle at the end. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Dave Cohen, welcome to The Self-Publishing Show. Uh, really looking forward to this interview. We met at London Book Fair. I immediately recognize a lot of the television programs and so on you'd worked on here in the UK. I'm a big fan of comedy, huge fan of comedy. Um, a bit like David Brent, I'm sort of, you know, full-time uh, <laughs> self-published author, part-time comedian. Not really. Chilled out, chilled out entertainer. <laughs> chilled out. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. And uh, that's the original office for our American friends. Uh, and yeah. But I think probably you should probably introduce yourself and tell us uh, a bit about yourself, Dave. Um, yes, I've, I've written comedy most of my uh, working life. I started out as a, a journalist. I didn't really know how to write comedy or that you could actually write comedy. Um, so I, I thought, well, if I get a job doing writing, that might get me somewhere. And um, this was way back in the early 1980s. And there was a, a thing happening uh, in Britain called alternative comedy, which had sprung out of the uh, 1970s punk movement. And that was the case where people who felt that they were excluded from the music industry had just gone off and created their own scene. Uh, are you spotting any parallels here, yeah. James? I yeah, wonder. Yeah. Um, so um, very much like uh, sort of you and Mark, really, uh, the, the, the sort of uh, John, Johnny Rotten and Malcolm McLaren of the, the 21st century. But, but, As we're often referred to, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes. But that, that was... Um, that was really how I got into comedy was because uh, there, there was just anybody could do it. And so I, I quit my journalist job and, and moved to London thinking I'd be a comedy writer and spent 10 years as a stand-up comedian, which right. was a sort of diversion, really. And that's, um, um, I mean, I can remember it clearly. So I was born in 67 and that was, right. that was absolutely my era as a kid. And I can remember going from... Saturday night entertainment, mainstream entertainment with guys with kind of ruffled velvet jackets, uh, like <laughs> Tarbuck and Americans won't know these names, Mike Yarwood. And then suddenly mm. the young ones came along, which was a, an anarchic BBC two sitcom about students living in a hovel together and um, Ben Elton on stand up. And I'm not sure what the American equivalent of this, I'm conscious most of our audience are American, um, but I guess SNL, I guess they went from the 50s kind of rather stayed and presented comedy to the more irreverent stuff around the same time. Yeah, I think what happened was that um, we, uh, in America, in the 50s and 60s, the stand-up comedy was was very much uh, New York, New York Jewish uh, influenced, very heavily influenced by that. Um, and then uh, there was a kind of period in the 60s and 70s where it became much more related to um, the, the Vietnam War. And um, so you got people coming from, uh, you had Lenny Bruce, who was oh, the, yeah. sort of the original alternative stand-up comedian in America. And, was and then George people, Cohen? George, was it George, George Cohen? George Carlin. George Carlin. George, George yeah, Cohen, Cohen, yes. yeah. Yeah, I'm Cohen, and you're also probably thinking of George Cohen, the uh, fullback for uh, England in the 1966 <laughs> World, World Cup, Cup final. Yeah. <laughs> uh, easy, easy mistake to make. But yeah, George Carlin and uh, Richard Pryor, particularly, yeah. um, and these guys, um, and then Steve Martin in the late 70s, these guys were presenting a, a, a way of doing comedy um that was similar. We had, like you say, the men with the, uh, the sort of fl 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 frilly shirts and they were always they were telling jokes um, about their their mother-in-laws and also about uh, the the uh, minorities that had come into the country in the sixties and seventies. And alternative comedy was just well, let's do stand-up comedy, but we don't really recognise these mother-in-law characters, and we don't really have feel animosity towards minority groups. So it was just really comedy without without racism and sexism and that became just a very 
massive thing. Like you say, the young ones appeared in 82. And then um, I, I moved to London actually in 83. And um, it was that there was this incredible uh, stand up comedy scene just starting up, and all the famous young ones people had all left these small pubs in London. So people like me arrived, and we were not very good, but we were allowed, we had like two years to get really good in private while people found out about us. Yeah. We should say um, there was some absolutely fantastic comedy both here and in the States in the 40s, 50s and 60s and 70s. It wasn't all kind of mother-in-law and racism jokes. I can very fondly remember two Ronnie sketches and Mock and Wise, which were, which I think you must be a fan of as well, some of the genius of that era. Uh, don't, I don't want to paint it all as a, as a bleak time, but the, the irreverence and anarchic switch in the 80s was, was distinct and dramatic. Well, I think you mentioned Ben Elton, really, and this is more where I'm coming from. And, and Ben Elton was the sort of marriage of what, what was called alternative comedy. But he also came very much from that tradition. And The Young Ones, uh, for all its anarchism, was very much kind of uh, like a love letter to some of the most sort of brilliant 70s sitcoms that defined British humour. And yes, I was a, a massive fan of them. And that's kind of where most of my writing has has kind of come through in, in the sort of subsequent time, really. And so mostly I have been working on writing for uh, sitcoms um, and um, panel shows as well, TV panel shows, and also songs. I, I wrote a lot of songs for a, a TV show called Horrible Histories, oh, yes. uh, kids, kids TV show, which I think is, is uh, has a little bit of popularity in America as well. So I, yeah. I, can, oh. I can mention that. Horrible Histories has been absolutely brilliant. And it's a, it's a kind of, it's almost like a Star Wars universe now, so many spin-offs and films and books and so on. It's, um, it's, it's brilliant, perfect for kids as well. Um, I think adults enjoy it. Um, yeah. And yeah, so 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 in your recent the last couple of twenty years or so, what programs have you been working regularly on that we would know? Um, again, there's the British shows, the uh, sitcoms, uh, not going out, um, and my family, and then also I worked with just also to mention with the horrible histories gang. They went on to make the show Ghosts, which has now become a a, a US. Uh, sitcom as oh, well yes. it's an adaptation so that, in the us rather than releasing the original yes that's right and yeah. that's i think uh, uh, it's been a, one of those rare occasions like the uk office that where the actual uh, move over uh, across the atlantic has been quite successful and i think that's what's been happening in british in comedy generally over the last 20 years or so i think the uk office uh started it with uh, Ricky Gervais becoming very successful in America and then uh, Michael Schur's adaptation of, of The Office for America. Uh, so, so it's kind of brought together. There's much, there's much less difference now, I would say, between British uh, co TV comedy and American TV comedy. We are going to talk about writing and, and become relevant to authors this thing in a minute, but uh, I, I want to talk to you a bit more about comedy before we talk about that. And I know you've written a book to help authors and so on, but... Um, you mentioned Jew Jewish New York, and I mentioned this to you uh, straight away because I'm such a huge fan of the sort of New York Jewish comedy scene, big mm -hmm. Kirby enthusiasm, and I was a massive Seinfeld fan. Uh, and I think it's still an important uh, era, but I think that's almost is. I wonder if that is that like the British things that's. It feels to me what I would consider more British humor, that Jewish New York humor, than perhaps some of the mainstream American humor, which didn't translate as well. Do you? Bill, that's the case. Do you mean that the stuff that that's, that that we have now has? Well, you, uh, is no, not I so mean much. going back to you've got Mel Brooks on the wall behind you, and, yeah. and Seinfeld, mm -hmm. and um, Gary, oh, what's his name, Shandling, Shandling, yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and and uh, Larry David, obviously now. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. know. Is that what we would describe as British humour? Slightly sarcastic mm -hmm. and. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting how um, the Jewish Jewish humour in in Britain was ne never quite the same thing as it was in America. I was there was myself a guy called Jerry Sadowitz hmm. uh, and uh, a, a Scottish comedian called Arnold Brown, and we were really the only Jewish stand up comedians in the eighties. But actually, some of the the biggest stars uh, from British comedy in the last sort of twenty thirty years, people like. Uh, Ali G, as mm. played by Sasha, Sasha Baron Cohen, uh, who also played Borat, and uh, Matt Lucas as well, who's a very big 
name um, mm. British comedy, and and they they both, I suppose, came from the the, the British that sort of seventies British tradition we've been talking about the old the the the, the old school the mother in law jokes that that kind of thing. I th- I think the main difference used to be, um, which is less so now, is there was that that the American comedy is mostly aspirational, and Jerry Seinfeld. Um, yes, that that's that's a sort of classic example, um, and his sidekick George is a classic loser character. But um, British comedy was much more about lovable losers, I think, yeah. and American comedy was much more about the sort of aspirational Jerry Seinfeld. So even the even the deeply flawed American sitcom characters like Frasier, um, he's a he is a a, a success. He is a big success at what he does and um 20 years ago you would never have had a british sitcom star being successful they're all we, we the kind of that sort of petty bureaucracy type people and uh, reggie, and also, reggie perrin and uh, fat leonard yeah. rossiter played se- several of those characters the rising down that's from, right yeah. yeah reggie perrin and it's interesting you mentioned uh reggie perrin because that that started out um that was originally a novel um, which which was then turned into uh, a sitcom. David Nobbs, probably the greatest, one of the greatest British comedy writers of the last fifty years or so. He he wrote the Reggie Perrin books. He he considered himself uh, a novelist first, although he wrote loads and loads of comedy for TV. He wrote for the Two Ronnies and all of those sort of great sketch shows. But it but it is. I I I think British comedy does have slightly more. We are a little bit more literary, I suppose, partly because we have that whole background of Shakespeare and Dickens and Austen. So so we come from that sort of more that that sort of more literary approach. I say Americans, it feels like it's a more aspirational. Uh, yeah, thing. yeah, the American dream. Um, and yeah. perhaps last question on the on the wider comedy area. You mentioned that we talked about that change in the 70s through to the 80s. F- sort of feels like it might be happening again now. It doesn't always feel in a positive way. You mentioned Jerry Sadowitz then, but he's somebody who's struggling to get stage space now because sort of, I don't hate to use the word cancelled, but sort of is being looked at as being cancelled because he, because people have decided suddenly that, that, that jokes were okay five years ago and no longer acceptable. Do you think that's happening again now or...? Yeah, I think I, I don't want to kind of overplay this whole you know cancel culture thing. It, it, it works both ways. I think you know there are a lot of there, there are definitely a lot of uh, white male seventy something famous comedy people in Britain who are saying nobody we we can't get work anymore. And there is an element of truth to the fact that comedy has become more. Uh, multicultural and then it's more younger people um is that a bad thing and not not necessarily and um speaking as a white male 60 something uh who's i've i've enjoyed i've enjoyed a very uh lucky time really and uh you know i i i understand how much harder it would be for me now starting up in that world but I, I think it's part of a general change anyway. I think, yeah, it, 40 years now, 40 odd years since the whole alternative comedy thing started. And it's, it's, it feels to me a little tired. I went to the Edinburgh Festival, the Edinburgh Fringe, where all the new comedy starts. And I was there last year. And that was kind of the first year since COVID that, that, that there were more, way more people there. Um, but it was interesting that they stand up comedians were struggling to get audiences but the people who were really getting audiences were people who did short form sketches right. um, on uh, youtube and tiktok and so it does feel that the, the the change that is coming is again it's kind of similar to that change that happened all that time ago people yeah. who don't have access to the normal channels of comedy, they're finding their own way. And I think it's quite exciting, actually. Yeah, there are some brilliant creative comedians on TikTok who've really owned that that format. And it'd be interesting yeah, how yeah. they transfer that to this stage or the wider outside of the yeah. uh, that shape. But um, 
Okay, so let's talk. So a rare thing, I think you do meet people who are brilliant comedians and brilliant comedy writers, and you ask them how they do it, and they say, I don't know, you know, kind of <laughs> yeah. say that. But you are somebody who, who, who does like to talk about the process and how you can be funny and how to write comedy. And I think you've, well, first of all, we should say you've, you've written a book aimed at writers on that subject. I have, yes. Um, the book that I've written, uh, and in fact, I've, I've rewritten it to sort of cope with the changes that are happening, it's called The Complete Comedy Writer. It is aimed, I should say, mostly at, at people wanting to write uh, comic, comic fiction or sitcom or screenplays. And I think it should make a, um, a distinction at this point that there is um, that, that comic fiction, when we talk about comic fiction, as in uh, the, the kind of writers we think of, people like uh, P.G. Woodhouse, for instance, um, uh, Sue Townsend, who wrote the Adrian Mole books, the Bridget Jones books by Helen Fielding. These are what I would call comic fiction. And I think in terms of the whole world of self-publishing and what's going on uh, in that world is um, what I'd talk about more is uh, you write in a genre, um, but it's about, which which isn't, comic but it's like thriller or young adult or or romance science fiction whatever but you you bring comedy to it and that's where i think i i haven't seen anyone really kind of doing that and that, that, that there are quite a lot of elements in the book that will help you to bring comedy to your fiction yeah, and I think most of our books have some comedy in it. I mean, I write thrillers, but I like there to be some levity in there. I like the banter that the armed forces have, and I use some of that. Some, that's always some great comedy. Romance in particular, contemporary romance. Lucy Scores books are hilarious, but they are yeah. essentially contemporary romance. So so there's there's something in it for those of us, unless you're writing really dark horror, maybe. Well, even then, you need the odd bit of levity. There's, there's no, you know, there, are, there, there's, there really isn't a genre. I mean, you're saying you you write um, military books, and you know what, what could be more kind of dark than you know people going out and literally killing other people yeah. uh, in war? And in, in fact, um, that there, there is a tradition of uh, comedy that that does that uh, deals with that. Um, obviously, there's the thing, things like from the the novels of say Joseph Heller, like Catch Twenty Two and um, Mash. Um, and of course, Bluestone Four Two in Britain as well. But these are all they, these are you know the, 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 that kind of dark underside. But it does show that every every topic does have uh, the potential for humour. Uh, I do work a lot with uh, new writers starting out and people who write uh, comedy and write drama and write fiction. And a lot of them say, "I'm a bit nervous about. I, I, I'm a bit scared of adding comedy." I think I'd like to uh, address that point, first of all. And I would say that if you can write, if you are a good writer, you can write, uh, you can write comedy and you can add, you can add comedy to your fiction. It's not the same as adding jokes, just having a string of jokes. Um, and again, that's the kind of difference between comic fiction and, and adding comedy. But, it, but you can bring humour and, and the humour that you bring is directly related to whatever it is you're writing. So, as you say, you have that kind of the, that banter for that army banter. But wh why why do they have that banter in the army? Because they're going out and they're doing absolutely terrible life and death things. And and you know, the, it's it's like a sort of safety valve, isn't it, for 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 soldiers um, to have this kind of black black gallows humour, really, because it's a kind of way of uh, kind of letting you do the thing, which is really, really yeah. awful thing. And you'd see it a lot as well with, uh, I mean, a lot of people who come to, came to uh, comedy, stand-up comedy, um, were doctors. And uh, there's, I've known quite a few uh, doctors who turned to comedy who had very, very sick, very dark sense of humor. Yeah. But I mean, what do you expect? They kind of had to run into rooms and help, people who were dying and you know they watch people die and they've 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 seen they've seen terrible things and and so for them humor is a is is a kind of you know a way of sort of letting off steam yeah and i think i think that's fairly universal but it's definitely a british thing uh, as well that black humor i can remember once i did cover a really horrible fatal accident in um in the ref and about six months later this guy's um air force jet hit the ground at 500 miles an hour and absolutely nothing left of anything uh, Five or six months later, I was in the squadron building and there was a black and white 
crash report with a picture on the front of this just a wreck. And obviously that was the the accident report. And I remember saying to the squadron boss, oh, is that is that I'm not going to say his name, is that so and so? And he said, Yeah, I think that's a bit of him there. And he pointed at the um <laughs> yes. the image and, and he was one of his yeah. mates. And and yeah. I, but that was exactly what you're talking about. You can't, you know, you can't go for those guys climbing back into an aircraft and flying the day after their friend was killed. You have to have yeah. some coping mechanisms in place, and that was one of them. And it's a it's a it's a good tradition and probably some sort of psych, psychological benefit. Yeah, and I think one other thing as well, we don't always necessarily see the join um, as uh, they used to say on Morecambe and Wise. Um, but uh, there is, you know, uh, when people say, well, why should I add comedy? I kind of say, well, why, why wouldn't you add comedy? And if you look at some, um, like, the, the, the Harry Potter series, which is, you know, the most successful book franchise in the history of the universe, <laughs> bar none. And you, you look at some, um, what J.K. Rowling does with the Harry Potter books, and no, you wouldn't say, oh, they're comedy books, would you? you uh, but... But actually, if you think about the the opening scene of the first Harry Potter book, it is an absolute yeah. classic comedy scene. And you're you're talking here about British and American humour. There's there couldn't be a more British uh, opening than the opening to Harry Potter, Suburban Street, the classic opening of all the seventy sitcoms. Yeah. yeah, and. Um, so it's like three or four in the morning when it's, it's late and, and the bloke dressed as a wizard walks up and you think, okay, well, <laughs> that could be, you know, some party or something. All right, I'll accept that. And then a cat turns into a witch and you go, oh, okay, all right, I realise now. But we've, we're, we're, still, we're still in this kind of normality of the suburban street and, we, you know, we've no idea what's going to happen. And then, you know, the, who is the main character? Harry Potter. And you always talk about when you first introduce your main character, you want to give them a, a big entrance. And, you know, here he comes. He's on a motorcycle being ridden by a giant, stra strapped to a giant, coming from out of the sky. And he lands in this little suburban street and puts this baby hat. And you go, okay. And, I mean, that is a really funny yeah. opening. And you look at all the people who play the secondary characters in the movies. You know, you've got Robbie Coltrane already in that opening. You've got John Cleese, uh, Zoe Wanamaker, Maggie Smith, all the sort of big name, great comedy actors. And that's how it's written. It's it, it, the, the, the main story is, yes, it's an adventure for kids, but there are all these comedy performers who bring just the little little extras to the scenes just to kind of make it more than just, oh, it's a book about a kid who does magic in a in a school. And if we think about why people enjoy reading our books, turn the pages, this has got to be a part of it, right? Um, you know, the, the reason yeah. we use humour in, in conversation is, is because it's an enjoyable way of talking. And if people are perhaps thinking, well, why, why people aren't reading through my books, this could be <laughs> something that's missing in a, in a book, just that that levity and that humour. So should we move, we should talk about a bit more practical tips on writing it, because I think I think you're right when you say people are scared of writing humour. It's famously difficult to write. Um, you might make it look easy, but you've been doing it for a few years. So how can you help us mere mortals? Well, I think... Uh, Again, and it's one of those things that um, you think about, well, I want to add some sense of uh, atmosphere to my book. And uh, I read um, a lot of books by Rose Tremaine, British novelist, and because I, I, I've also, I've, I've started writing novels myself. Um, and um, I get, Rose Tremaine is absolutely brilliant at, at providing a sense of place and smells and, and atmosphere. And she does it, so, so such a light touch. I sort of want, I want to be able to do it like that. Or if you want to add some suspense, you know, you'll kind of read Stephen King and you'll get a sense of, how, oh, this is how you do suspense. So you want to write, you want, you, you want to add comedy. You, you read some of the best comedy and you learn from how, how it has been uh, done. So starting with JK Rowling, um, these secondary characters are, are one of the first ways that you do manage to do it. So you've got a kind of character, you've got the, the story is being told through the kids and then, but you've got 
these teachers in the background and there is something about the teacher so so it's when you're creating your secondary characters and you're looking for various ways that they're, they're it's like when you create any character i mean characters in drama have uh flaws characters in comedy have flaws and they they think of themselves in a certain way and other people look at them uh in another way so there's not a huge difference between creating a, a, a comedy character and uh, a, a non-comedy character. The most important thing about your comedy character is they they lack self-awareness. They yeah. don't they don't necessarily realise that they are funny or the butt of jokes. And there are so many ways that you can do this. Um, you know, you could make a character sort of pompous, very full of self-belief. Um, so. For instance, you would have a, te- a, a teacher who thinks they're the best teacher in the world and the students all think they're rubbish, um, but that teacher believes it. And so straight away, you've got a, a, a nice sort of comedic conflict working there um, with those with those two, uh, with, with, with that character and, and the students. So that so so the, the flawed nature, and I can see straight away, I mean, Hagrid is, is you mentioned Robbie Coltrane character in Harry Potter films, um, who's not the brightest tool in the box. And that's kind of his flaw. You sort of failed as a teacher and banned from doing magic. Um, <laughs> but the self-awareness is a really interesting point. The more I think about it, I was, um, I was thinking about the other day, uh, I don't know why I was thinking about this. I saw Will Ferrell in something else, but Will Ferrell's performance in uh, the Christmas film in, in Elf, yeah, which is a super Christmas film. But I think the reason it works so well is he plays it so earnestly and is completely unaware a hundred percent unaware of how ridiculous he is, and that's what makes that film work. And if you if he deviated as an actor, or you got a, someone else who did it from that one iota, that would that would stop being as good and as funny and as lovable. If he had a smile on his face because he kind of knew he looked ridiculous, um, that's and that's might be an extreme example of something that I think you've just really alerted me to is that that lack of self awareness is a key to that comedy character working. Yeah. That's right, and uh, we were talking a little bit uh, earlier about uh, David Brent, the uh, the original, the UK office character played by Ricky Gervais, and this character all through the, the series is completely lacking in self awareness. He he has absolutely no idea that everybody hates him. Um, he thinks that he's really really popular. Right up until about the last five minutes in the last Christmas special, there is a there is a moment um, at the end of this the UK office where he it dawns on him and all the all the everyone's uh, you know sort of joshing him in the way that they always do and he's always standing there going ha ha yeah that's really funny isn't it you're calling me an idiot yeah and and they throw, uh, one of the characters said no no no. We really mean it, Brent. We really think you're an idiot. We really think you're pathetic and useless. And there is just like a moment on his face. And in that moment, the the show is over because that's the whole the whole thing is built around his lack of self awareness. And within ten minutes of that happening, all the strands of the plot uh, are, 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 are the previous two series and the Christmas episode they're all drawn together. The whole sort of subplot love story is is dealt with uh brent gets a moment of self-awareness and meets somebody who actually is quite really, nice yeah. <laughs> like likes him anyway despite the fact that he's like that it's like the end of a sort of classic hollywood yeah. romantic comedy and um and so and that's it and that's the end that no more no more episodes uh, brilliant and you know and obviously they come back 10 years later to do um when the uh, someone offers them makes them an offer they can't refuse um but still it's like yes this is the perfect place to end this because you can't do he can't be david brent anymore of those first two series because he has that self awareness so yeah the lack of self awareness is so important and it's really the only difference i would say between comedy stories and dramatic stories you you have a character who goes on a journey and and you have it in every book and every uh film or whatever and they go through a journey and they get to a certain point where all is lost or all is won or whatever and they have to deal with that and they go through that 
battle, whatever, they slay the dragon, they 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 zap the spaceships, whatever, and they come through it, and they've grown as characters. And that's the only difference that in comedy, the character doesn't grow, the character doesn't learn. Yeah. They're going to come back next week and make the same mistakes. But, I mean, that is something, since I've been writing, I'll probably spend a bit more time thinking about character journeys. And that is something I noticed. Uh, we talk about Alan Partridge a lot in the UK. He's a fantastic comedy character. I don't know if you've ever worked any Partridge stuff, have you, Dave? I never have. I was there at the, I was there right at the start. I was doing, doing a show with uh, Steve Coogan that, uh, and it was the first time he ever tried out this uh, new character that he had, uh, who was this sports reporter. Um, um, and it was, um, yeah, I, I mean, it, it still, I, I just weep when I watch Alan yes. Partridge. I, mean, I, yeah. I can't. It's, I don't know how, whether it, how it's got any whether it's got any traction in the states or not i don't know but if you if you like comedy at all um do look up alan partridge on um on youtube because it is brilliant it's, it's painful sometimes to watch yeah. but one thing i noticed so they did a film alpha papa i think they're supposed to do another one i don't know if they're going to do that yeah, yeah. but oh, they are mm -hmm. good so alpha papa now when you do a film it's a li di bit different from a 25 minute tv episode or even a 10 minute short there has to be this this story arc, this character arc. That, uh, you have to have a certain feeling at the end that this, that this journey's taken place. And what I did notice about that for the first time is what you've just pointed out, is that Alan Partridge did not change one iota. He went on quite a dramatic journey in that film with a kidnapping hostile, but he was exactly the same at the end as he was at the beginning, sort of breaking the rules that we're all taught when we're writing novels about our main, main character, who has to change and has to come to some sort of realisation at the end of their, their journey. But that's opposite yeah. for comedy. It is. And it, that there is a kind of difficulty in this. There is a contradiction. And now that very much the thing that uh, with Netflix is comedy drama. Netflix say, oh, and, and the BBC, uh, I write a lot for the BBC, um, and they all, the, the commissioners always say, we want comedy drama now. And in my head, well, you know, okay, so comedy, uh, you want characters who never learn. And but you want drama as well, so the character has to needs learn. to learn. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it's like, how do mm. you how do you find a way of marrying that? And you can do it. And there are there are characters. Um, for instance, the American show Modern Family has uh, this character Phil Dunphy, who's the sort of all American uh, sitcom dad. We love Phil. The, yeah, everybody loves Phil. He wants to be the perfect dad. He wants to be his dad. We all loved his his dad. Um, and he always tries, but he, he tries too hard. He's always trying to do stuff for his kids or his wife. And they, they're just too big and they're too grand and they, they, they fail. They always fail. And so there's a point about two thirds of the way into every episode of Modern Family where Phil has failed. And it's just like an instant that the, the mask drops. And, in, and instead of being, hey, oh God, I'm wacky, there's just a moment of like, Oh, mm. real anger and we get and we're all shocked because you know that's not that's not the phil we know but actually that's the real phil and we like him now because we've seen him for real and then so there's about four minutes of the show left and in the next four minutes he kind of he he realizes and he grows and he understands what he did wrong but and it by re the end, resets <laughs> yeah completely reset he's completely forgotten it and that's like real life isn't it yeah. i mean we think about we think about how many times you've been told to take out the rubbish on tuesday night and, and no matter how many times you know you get told off for do not doing it it doesn't sink it and you're, oh yeah 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 God, I, i'll remember i remember it's just you don't remember and so yeah. come next week you've forgotten it yes. again and yeah. that's uh, and that's how you can keep a comedy character going, um, how you can have a, like a secondary character. In a bit. And, you know, you think about some of these characters, like you mentioned uh, Hagrid uh, in, in Harry Potter, and he keeps making the same mistakes. We love him anyway because he's just, you know, he's just clear and simple and he loves Harry and that's what all that he lives for is that he loves Harry. So, but... He can't stop making the same mistakes, and you know, and it, and and it's it's like Charlie Brown and Lucy, you know. Obviously, yeah. I will. I promise this time, I'm really gonna <laughs> pull, keep the pull, ball there. Yeah. I'll, you know, kick the ball, and then and each each time she takes it away. Well, you know, I have to take it away. It's who I am. It's what I do. You know, yeah. so 
but there's always room for that in when you're kind of creating comedy characters. One area we haven't talked about is observational comedy or observation, which I think you're, I mean, I'm sure looks from the outside like another very important part of it. You mentioned Phil Dunphy. I, I was thinking as you were talking about him that he was reminded me of Clark Griswold from the National Lampoon's films as this earnest father who, and I think this is great observational as a father who's got to trying to get enthusiasm going and is being greeted by arms folded and grumpy teenagers. And, you know, it does feel exactly like Phil being Phil and Clark Griswold on occasions. So that observation of real life, that seems to be another key part of, of comedy. Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, I've, I've talked a little bit about, you know, the difference between writing a comedy thing and adding comedy. Um, and when you're writing a comedy thing and you put lots of jokes in, then that's fine. And I think that's what, another of the things that stops people from writing. They think, oh, I can't write jokes. But actually, jokes are... The, the, are the way to sort of get those observations in there. And jo jokes are kind of exaggerations of real life. So that's really all they are. And um, there's a very famous British writer called Dennis Norden, um, who through the sort of 40s, 50s and 60s was was peerless in, in Britain, a great comedy writer. And he describes jo joke, he defines a joke. He said, every joke is a momentary removal of sympathy and uh, I, I just thought this. Uh, ever since I heard that phrase from him, I've kind of looked at every single joke and just thought, Ooh, "Yep, he's right. Yeah. Yep, that one." <laughs> you think, "No, that can't be it." And 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 it is. And uh, and all it is is that you're taking something that is a reality and mocking it. But we. But that doesn't mean, therefore, all comedy is cruelty. Because the key word in there is momentary. It's a momentary removal of sympathy. So, yeah, for the moment we laugh and also we go, thank goodness that's not me. Um, but then we also look at that moment and go, yeah, I can see why why he acted in that way. And it's funny when people then mock him for it. But um, it's interesting that a lot of people – look at sarcasm which i think again is a great british um export yeah that's we we do sarcasm better than anyone we're, else we're, we should get gold medals in the olympics for that. we could definitely if if uh, if america is aspirational we're just sarcastic oh yeah well done yeah. mate oh yeah, very yeah. good work <laughs> yeah but there is also, I mean, and there's been surveys done about this as well, actually. And one of the writers that I've written a lot for, a British comedian, Lee Mack, who is a mm. brilliant comedian, and he's in the sitcom Not Going Out, and he does a lot of uh, panel shows. So he's just naturally funny very, guy. Very, very quick-witted. Very quick-witted. And sarcasm is, you know, key thing. I, John Cleese was also very much yeah. uh, sort of king of sarcasm, and that became very popular. Although That's we should also say Chandler's in character in Friends made a, a you know, his central yeah. plank was sarcasm as well. So it's not entirely British. Yeah, although I would say that the central thing about Chandler is that he he uses humour to hi hide his insecurities. Yes, which, which is a which is just a genius thing for comedy writers to be able to say, we've got a character and they can only joke. Yes. and it's like you've got the best gag writers in the world writing for this character, and so and every, every no line wonder. will be a deflective joke. Yeah, uh, absolutely, totally memorable. Yeah. Uh, by the way, and lots of people, I should just say this: if you've put if you've got a character in your book or wherever saying. Uh, too much information, or did I say that out loud? You have unwittingly stolen a line from Friends because these lines were so. Uh, they, they're, they're, they're was that, was became... that their first appearance of TMI? And yeah, yeah. Did I say that out um, loud? So they became cliches overnight because they were such brilliant lines. Yes. And so everybody thinks, oh, it's something that's out there. No, you but, took it from Friends. Wow. So, uh, uh, I didn't realize that. Yeah. So. Um, it's worth worth remembering that, and um, I've completely forgotten what yes. I was Sorry, I interrupted about you. Talk about John Cleese and Lee Mack. Um, oh yes, yeah. I interrupted myself. So yes, sarcasm, which is a great British trait, and Americans, I do appreciate our sarcasm as well. And Larry David, you mentioned yes. as well. But sarcasm and warmth, they are kind of they 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 are often talked of in the same way. So there is 
comedy isn't just about cruelty. It's also about warmth and a shared experience. And that's another another reason why why wouldn't you want to have comedy in your in your action adventure or whatever, really? So um yeah. Well, I'm I absolutely I could honestly go on for another couple of hours, uh, Dave. I'm gonna have to bore you over a pint at some point. A friend of mine who, who's um he's actually a Sky News presenter, but he and I have occasionally sat down and tried to write comedy. But um, we perhaps buy you a pint one night and you can teach us uh, in, in five minutes how to do it and then we'll be genius comedy writers. But um, do you want to just uh, give your book a proper plug, uh, Dave, so people know exactly where to yeah. find it? As I say, the emphasis on the book, uh, this is, I'm holding it up for those of you who are not listening, uh, complete comedy writer. It's, it is more about writing comic fiction, as I say, yes. or screen, comic screenplays. But a lot of the the uh, things that are in there are like creating these secondary uh, characters or things like creating subplots is another uh, area you'd want to look at. Uh, having a having two idiot characters, uh, nothing nothing ever suffers from having two idiot characters in it. Um, and and even like the darkest, some of the darkest uh, books or shows, or um, I think there's a. Again, a British show called Happy Valley, which yes. um, I know I know you're a, a, a fan of, James, as well. And that's a very deep, dark, horrible, uh, gruesome murder mystery story. But it's also got some fantastic comedy. And there are these two, there are these sort of two hard guys who cause quite a lot of trouble in the last series. But um, one of them is getting married on Wednesday and he has to go on Tuesday and create some big commotion in a courtroom. And, and so he gets, he gets beaten up and, and there's this, this, just this sort of ridiculous idea that this guy who's involved in this sort of terrible crime things, he's, he's, he's off to get married the next yeah. day. Oh God, God what's, what's she going to say when she sees this bump on my head? You know, and, <laughs> and I was going to say comic relief is something I remember from my BBFC days when we were film examining and giving certificates. It's actually, pretty important in films particularly and we would note it if there was a, a heavy duty scene and a strong use of language or something that might change the certificate of the film but if there's comic relief it does dissipate that that tension that tone and the context of the, of the scene and there's yeah. a reason why writers put comic relief in the kind of texture and tone so something else people would definitely benefit from understanding even if they're not writing direct comic fiction yeah. And I am work. I do work with writers as well. If you want to uh, get in touch with me, and my, my website is davecohen.org.uk, and you can find out uh, how to do that from that website. Um, so yeah, I, I I meet with people and chat with them, meet online, and and find out what they what they're looking to do and what they how they want to kind of bring comedy in, and I can sort of help them, and I can look at the work and, and tell them how best to to go about that. Superb. Well, I've absolutely loved chatting to you, Dave. I'm so pleased we bumped into each other uh, over a drink at uh, in London uh, yep. back in March. And uh, yeah, let's stay in touch. Well, yes, I look forward to um, seeing what you and your Sky reporter friend have to offer. We're the next big things in our late middle <laughs> age, but uh, we may yeah. have, we may may have missed that boat. But we'll uh, we'll have fun trying. Yeah. <laughs> This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. There we go. Okay, so that was Dave Cohen, and uh, uh, I, I foresee at some point maybe even doing a little bit of um, like a live or Q and A with Dave because it's a really interesting topic. I think people who do write comedy might want to pick the brains of somebody who makes a living and has spent a career writing comedy. Um, as you know, Jimmy Carr's a great comedian. I think he has crossed over to America. People probably know who he is, and he does talk about. He, he, one of his tools was called the joke technician. There's a technical side to comedy. Um, or was, there's a quote in there in the interview. I can't remember who came up with it, but he said comedy is the, I think with Barry Cryer, is the brief suspension of sympathy. There's a sort of harshness mm. to a joke, you know, and he said almost every joke you can think, the reason it worked is you have no sympathy briefly on the poor soul who's the butt of that joke. Okay, right, Mark, I'm yeah. off to play with my switch. Okay, yeah, very good. Incredibly um, yeah, geeky, but that's, uh, that's what we, we come to expect. I think I think we need to I'm cut in at... the auxiliary power, Chewy. There we go. Put in the auxiliary power, Chewy. <laughs> yeah. 
That's a really Thank stupid God. bit in Star Wars. Like, I mean, in Star Wars, because Han says no it one twice. Is listening. And then, and then no Chewie just moves the knob. At this point. Chewie moves the knob right in front of both of them. I'm thinking, Han, why don't you just do it? It was so important. Anyway, probably shouldn't go down that, that rabbit hole. Uh, I think no. that's it for this week. There'll be more serious stuff next week. Tune in. Will there? Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll wait with bated breath. All right. Good night to all you truckers out there. Yes. <laughs> and that is it. All right. All that remains for me to say is goodbye from him. And a goodbye from me. Goodbye. Goodbye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing. So get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.